have a bumper this morning with cool video and music. I think since it's Father's Day that we should take a minute and honor the father of this house, our pastor, the man who has gone ahead before all of us, the man who made decisions years ago that put all of us in seats today. So can we just take a minute as Pastor Dwayne comes to give us the word, can we honor the father of this house today and show him how much we love him? Why don't you give Jesus a big hand clap right now online? Just put in your little praise hands emojis. I believe somebody came to give God some praise today. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. But He's a good, good Father today. Let's thank God for a good, good Father. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Thank you so much. One of the greatest joys of my life is to be a dad. Now to be a granddad. And to have the honor to be the father of this house. The under shepherd under Jesus is, is one of the great honors of my life. I love this house. This is the greatest church in all the world. And I love you dearly, dearly, dearly. Well, I had a message planned. And then Pastor Cody wrecked us last week. I mean, he, he was winding up our church in the wild out of the book of Acts. So we thought, but I'm kind of adding a PS to it. Because he said something that just gripped me in his message. And he was telling the story leading up to Acts chapter 20 something wherever he was at last week 25 6 7 I can't remember exactly uh, the reference but he he told and mentioned a story in Acts 14 if you have your Bibles you can turn there or turn on there whichever way it is to Acts chapter 14 and I'm gonna he didn't read the text I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna pick up on that and I believe I have a word from heaven for us today. Acts chapter 14, verse 8 through 12. While they were at Lystra, everybody say Lystra. Remember that city, Lystra. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with cri crippled feet, been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached, looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called him in a loud, to him in a loud voice saying, stand up. The man jumped to his feet and started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, these men are gods in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker of the two. If you were to keep reading the next six verses, Paul, they, they're one, they, they think they're God, so they get animals they're going to sacrifice to their God, these new gods. Paul is mortified, and Barnabas are mortified, and they tell them, no, 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 you can't do that, we're just humans. They tell them about Jesus, they preach the gospel, and then you get to verse 18. It says, then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. It's interesting, the same crowd that was cheering them and calling them gods just a few moments, a few verses before. They stoned Paul and they dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. They left him there as if he were. But as believers gathered around him, he got up. And he went back into the town. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to put me on like a coat and wear me today. I ask you to speak 
to every man, woman, boy, girl that would listen within the sound of my voice, whether live online or live on campus or later online, whether they're in the comfort of their home or in the contagious atmosphere of this auditorium, I pray that your presence would permeate their mind, their will, and their emotions, and that you would give me entrance into their hearts, and none of us would leave this word today the same way we came to it, but let us be changed and transformed on this wonderful Father's Day, in Jesus' name, and if you agree, say yes. Now here, Paul, Paul starts out this day, he's having a great day. Any, any, anybody like it when your day starts well? Come on, five of you. Let me try that again. Do you like it when your day starts well? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great day. I mean, I don't know about you, but if my day starts with God using me to heal a man who's been crippled in his entire life, never walked, and he jumps up and starts walking, that's a good day. I, I'm not sure how many of your days have started that way. I haven't had nearly enough start that way. But, but, but I'm believing for more, Amen. And so, so Paul says, so it's great, this guy, this dude gets healed. And then it goes from being a great day to really weird in a minute. Because, because it goes from, from this guy being healed to everybody in Lystra saying they're gods. And they're naming them Zeus and Hermes. And, 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 and they're saying that, that, that you're, you, you, you know, you, you, you're these gods that have come to earth. And so they're, they're wanting to sacrifice animals and worship them. That's, now it's a really weird day. I don't know about you, but I've not had many days that started with a lame man getting healed. But I've also not had many days when people were worshiping me. <laughs> Matter of fact, I've never had a day like that. People are grabbing bulls and goats trying to sacrifice them and worship me as if I were a Greek god. But then it goes from really good to really weird to really bad. Because then they stone him. And they didn't kill him, but they left him for dead. They threw him outside the city and just left him to die, assuming he would die. So, so, so it goes from a really great day to a really weird day to a really bad day really quickly. But in verse 20, it says, as the believer." In other words, the church in the city gathered round him, he got up, and he came back into town. Now, can I just say something? If you stone me, I ain't going back into town. If you stone me, I ain't coming back. I'm moving on. Moving on up. Duty. I'm getting out of Dodge. If you stone me, I'm leaving. Is there anybody with me? See, I grew up in Decatur, Texas. Some of you don't know where Decatur, Texas is. Some of you that are watching online from other nations, you would have no idea. Decatur's a small town uh, in, in, in north, north central Texas. I grew up there from the time I was five till the time I was 17, 16, 17. I lived in Decatur, Texas. Decatur, Texas is a place of great paradox for me because on one hand, it's a, great, it's a place of great pain. I was bullied in Decatur, Texas. I was called names in Decatur, Texas. I was beat up in Decatur, Texas. Matter of fact, I could take you to the schoolyard, places where I was picked on and beat up. I could take you to that very place. I have vivid and fond memories that are very painful in Decatur, Texas. I know what junior high, some of you never heard, y'all don't know junior high school. How many of you are old enough to remember junior high school? Now we have middle school, but, but, but we used to have junior high school. And, and I can tell you what the old junior high school smelled like in Decatur, Texas. I can tell you what band hall smelled like. Because <laughs> it was in the basement, it didn't smell good. I can tell you what the what the hallowed halls of that school. Why? Because I have vivid memories of them. And how many of you know sometimes you, 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 when you've had a bad situation, you attach so much emotion and feeling to that. Anytime you go back, it can be painful. 
That was Decatur, Texas for me. I had left Decatur at 16 or 17 and I came back to visit, but I never planned to live there. And then, matter of fact, I'd I'd lived in in Azel and and around that area for a long time, and then, which is a good bit away from Decatur, then I moved to England, so I lived in another nation, never thinking I would move back to Decatur, and God told me to move back to Decatur, Texas, and I said, "Uh uh-uh. Not no, but uh uh-uh. Have you ever told God, "Uh uh-uh? Not no, but uh uh-uh. And, and so I, I, I didn't want to go back to Decatur, Texas, but Paul decided to get up and come back. Like I said, not me. No way. I, 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 I had some bad memories in Decatur, but I never got stoned. <laughs> A lot of people got stoned in Decatur, but that's different reasons. They, they were kind of stoned. I never got stoned either way. But, but maybe, why would Paul get up and come back? Somebody say, get up and come back. Maybe it's because Paul understood something. My, and Pastor Cody said this last week, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. My greatest influence is on the other side of my comeback. See, there were people waiting on Paul to come back. There were miracles waiting for Paul to come back. They were on the other side of his comeback. There were letters to be written, two-thirds of the New Testament, because Paul made a come back. There were churches to be planted because Paul got to the other side of his comeback. Sometimes you just need to get up and come back. Sometimes you just got to get a little bit of comeback on the inside of you. I come to tell somebody today, God is ready for you to make your biggest comeback. Is there anybody in this house that says, I might have been down, I might have been stoned, I might have been run out of town on a rail, but God is ready to help me make a come back. I'm going to get up and come back. You get a bad doctor's report, you got to get up and come back. You get laid off from work and you ain't got no money in the bank, you got to get up and come back. There's a global pandemic. Some of you just need to get up and come back. You lost that one you loved, but God says, get up and come back. Those people hurt you and abuse you. You've been laying there, but God got you in a place to tell you, get up and come back. Somebody shout, come back. What's on the other side of your comeback? You you just got to get a little comeback in you. Some of you had lay down. You got to get get up in you. Paul was a victim of a great tragedy. But he never had a victim mentality. Let me say it again. I said Paul was a true victim of a great tragedy, but he refused to let the enemy give him a victim mentality. And by doing so, he showed us that hard times are no excuse to serve God part-time. Let me say that again. I said, Paul, Paul showed us that hard times are no excuse to serve God part-time. This is a man who wrote, this momentary light affliction is producing in me a far more eternal weight of glory. While we look not at things which are seen, but things which are unseen, because things which are seen are 
temporary, but things which are unseen are eternal. Momentary, light, affliction. He was shipwrecked, knocked in the head, left for dead. I get upset if my Netflix buffer's too long. <laughs> my internet doesn't work. I want to throw the phone or the TV across the room. Come on, can I get a witness? And Paul said, my, this momentary, somebody say momentary, light affliction. You've been stoned. Some of you go, yeah, a lot of times, you know. I had a few joints in my day. No, I ain't talking about that kind of stone. You ever had people throw rocks at you until they thought you were dead? You've been shipwrecked in the last week or two? Thrown out of, si out of the city, left for dead? Paul did, and he called it momentary light affliction. Is producing in me God's glory so watch this what the enemy means to end your story God is using to produce his glory <laughs> no 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 listen if you're if you if you're tweeting that's a good tweet right there if you're Instagram storying that's a good one right there but let it sink in while you're doing it <laughs> what the enemy means to end your story God's using to produce his glory. So the enemy thought, Paul's story's over. He was stoned and left for dead. They thought it's over. The enemy thought he killed him, but God was setting him up for a great comeback. Somebody say, come back. He got up and he came back. That's a prophetic word for somebody today. Listen to me. If you're online or if you're here on campus, this is a word for somebody. Get up and come back. Get up and come back. Paul shows us clearly that it doesn't matter what's been done to you. It's how you respond to it. That makes all the difference. Because greater is he that's in you than whatever is happening around you. So, so, so how did Paul do it? Well, in verse 20, he gives us a key. It says, it says as the believers gathered around him. So, so Paul taught us this. My courage to come back is linked to community. It was when the believers gathered around him that he, may, he had the courage to come back. You're probably not going to come back alone. It doesn't say they went with him to come back, but they gave him the courage to come back. It was because they were with him that he got the courage to go, whether they went with him or not. There's a direct tie to them being gathered around him. It's interesting. Decatur, Texas, Growing up was a place of great pain. And it's also, I said it was a great place of paradox because it was also a place God produced glory. It was a place where I found community in a local church at about 13 years old. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I got my first prophetic words in Decatur, Texas. I got called to ministry in Decatur, Texas. I got missions in my heart in Decatur, Texas. And if I had never had that community, I'd have never had the courage to come back all those years later. Come on, are you here? And because I had the courage to come back, it was when I was living in Decatur that God showed me to plant the bridge in Denton, Texas. So there was, some, there was a greater influence on the other side of my comeback. But that comeback, the courage to do it, came from a community of people that gathered around me and helped heal what was wrong on the inside of me so that I could have the courage to keep coming back. I just want to tell you, your greatest influence is on the other side of your comeback. But also the courage to come back and see that influence happen is going to be built in community. 
I'm convinced if I hadn't got rooted in a local church as a teenager, I'd have never had the courage to do everything God called me to do. And 62 nations later, 4 million air miles later, preaching face-to-face to over 150,000 pastors and leaders 30 years later, it's because a community of people gave me the courage to come back. This is a great story, but there's something hidden in this story that I'd always missed, and actually Cody showed it to me. But you got to keep reading. I've read Acts through the book of Acts through many times. But many, most of the time I read it scattered. But even in reading it straight through, I, I miss this. You pick it up if you go to Acts 16, verse 3. Turn there real quick. A couple of chapters beyond where we just were. Starting in verse 1. Paul went first to Derby and then to where? Everybody say Lystra. Where did he get stoned? Lystra. Where did he make his comeback? Lystra. There was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra, so Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. See, Paul doubles back after he had left Lystra and he went on to several places. He's doubling back, making his way back to Antioch. And the second place he stops is the very place where he was stoned, left for dead, run out of city on a rail, and where he made his comeback, Lystra. And there he meets this young man named Timothy. If Paul had never had a comeback to Lystra, he would never probably, most likely have ever found Timothy. Timothy becomes a traveling buddy, but more than a traveling buddy, Timothy becomes a spiritual son. I'll talk about that in a moment to, to Paul. He ends up pastoring in Ephesus. I've been to Ephesus, the ancient city. I've walked down the streets. I've been in the Grand Theater where Paul was arrested. And it dawned on me, walking those streets, this is where young Timothy had a church of over 20,000 before he was 25. Some believe he was in his very early 20s or younger. He was in a society dominated by elder men. It wasn't like our society today where we celebrate youth. They only celebrated age and honor. But Paul, that's why Paul told Timothy let, in one of his letters, let no man despise your youth. Because God was using this young man to do great exploits. Paul writes two letters to Timothy, the second one in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. I'm reading in the Message Bible. You can hear this love for young Timothy in his voice. Listen to this. He says, every time I say your name in prayer, which is practically all the time. That sounds like a father, doesn't it? I thank God for you, the God I worship with my whole life in the tradition of my ancestors. I miss you a lot, especially when I remember that last tearful goodbye. And I look forward to a joy-packed reunion. Paul never had that reunion, at least not on this side of heaven. Many believe 2 Timothy was the last letter he ever wrote from prison in Rome before he was beheaded. So here Paul, this heart of a father, tells him to my son Timothy. That's how he starts his first letter. To Timothy, my spiritual son. You can hear this father heart in prison, about to die, encouraging his son, saying, I'll never forget our last tearful goodbye. And I can't wait till we have this joyful reunion. So today, hidden in this text, we see that my comeback is not just for me. It's for all those coming after. play, Aaron, whenever you're ready. 
My comeback's not just for me. God would do it just for me. But if my greatest influence is on the other side of it, it's because there's a Timothy there. Maybe today you've wanted to quit. Maybe you've been discouraged. Maybe you're sitting at home thinking, I want to give up. God has a comeback for you because there's there's sons and daughters waiting on you. There are 400 years of silence from the Old Testament, the last words in the Old Testament, to the announcement of the birth of Jesus by the angel in the New Testament. It's interesting, the last thing he said, Malachi 4, 5, chapter 4, verse 5. Some people uh, will debate whether Malachi was the, the last book in timeline, but most people would agree that it was. So these are probably the last words, the last two verses of the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament. So before God goes silent for 400 years, for us that go back to 1620. It would be as if there had been no prophetic voices, no word of God, no living word spoken for 400 years. It says, behold, I'll send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I don't want to get into what the great and dreadful day of the Lord is if you want to know that, go back to the midweek lives on eschatology in the end time and you can probably figure it out. But I want to key in on this phrase, I'll send you, before that day, I'll send you Elijah, the prophet. Why Elijah? Why not Elisha? Elisha did double the miracles of Elijah. He was more the powerhouse. Why not pick him? I think the key is in the next verse. The last verse of the Old Testament. And he, God, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Sam, can you come here for just a second? This is my brand new son-in-law. In whom I am well pleased. Why, why Elijah? Why not Elisha? Elijah was an old guy. Elisha was a young guy. Elijah was a former glory. Elisha represents a new glory. Why wouldn't it be? I'll come in the spirit of Elijah. I mean Elisha, the the double anointing, the new guy, the the the, the fresh thing. Why why Elijah? Why not Elisha? To understand it, you have to understand a principle that was instituted in their relationship. Elijah was a prophet, and it came time to pick a new prophet, and he he picks Elisha, and they go through a long process for that to happen. But at the end of of their relationship, Elijah says to Elisha, what do you want? I'll give you something, whatever you want. You've been faithful all these years. You've served me. You've followed me. you honored me. I'll give you, what do you want? And he said, I want a double anointing. And, and Elijah says, well, you ask a hard thing. Now, if you just think of anointing as power to do miracles, it sounds a little arrogant. Like, Elisha's like, hey, dude, you know I'm a really big deal. So you, there's no way God's going to give you twice the anointing I have. But that's not what he was saying. The word double anointing is a double portion. It's an inheritance issue. And, and, and they understood something, that when a priest, like Aaron, would get anointed, they would anoint his garment. Then when his son was going to be anointed, they wouldn't give him a new garment. They would take the garment of the father, and they would tailor it to fit the son. And then they would get anointing oil, and they would anoint him, and it would run down his head, down his beard, onto the garment, all the way down to the hem. It was called a double anointing. So, Because when Aaron was anointed, they did the same thing. So the garment carried the residue of the father and the fresh anointing of the son. 
it carried the former glory of the Father and it carried the fresh glory of the Son. Is there anybody in here? So, so, so what he was saying is, you're asking a hard thing because you're not my natural son. And right there, God instituted a principle called spiritual sonship. Thank you. So when Paul is talking about his son in the faith, his spiritual son, Timothy, he's saying, Timothy, you may not have been birthed from me naturally, but I had a whole comeback. just for you. So today we honor dads. We honor dads spiritually and we honor dads naturally. And we especially want to thank you whether you're a natural father or a spiritual father. Thank you for your great comeback. For some people, Father's Day is hard because your dad wasn't the greatest. But I got good news for you. Paul tells Timothy, remember the legacy you have from your mother Lois and your grandmother Eunice. He never mentions his dad. All we know is his dad was a Greek, so he might have been a heathen. So, so it, either way, he didn't make the cut. But, but his mother, maybe he was a single, she was a single parent. Maybe his dad was a Greek and he died. We don't know. But his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, make it into the Bible. His daddy never makes it. That's some good news for some single moms. Because I got news for you. If you get in the house of God, if you get in the community of faith, we together can be Paul's to your little Timothy. And we can help raise them to not be fatherless. Because in the house of God, there are no fatherless children. Because we're here to adopt them all. One of the greatest barrier breakers to racial division is adoption. Because if, if you're black and you adopt some little white or brown boys or girls, you're going to love all colors. If you're white and you adopt a, a little black boy or girl or a little brown boy, you're going to love all colors. Come on, are you here? And if you're brown, or come on, whatever color you are, if you adopt people that don't look like you all of a sudden your family looks like the kingdom of heaven and you can't have hatred and you can't have racial division and you can't have racism in your heart that's my it's my kids it's my family don't mess with my kids Timothy may not have had a great natural father, but he had a spiritual father named Paul. So even if your dad was absent, you can have spiritual fathers in the household of faith. And if you're here today, and you're, you're, you're a male and you're not a dad, or you're not a dad yet, go adopt some kids. Even if you don't literally physically adopt them, just take them on and love them. Be a father figure. Be a spiritual dad. See, I'm glad I came back. Because I got sons and daughters on these front rows. They wouldn't be here if I didn't come back. What's on the other side of your comeback? It's people. See, you could be somebody's Timothy or Tammy. Gender non-specific. So, so if you're here and you're a female, you say, what does that have to do with me? You may not have had a great dad, but you can be somebody's Timothy or Tammy. You could be somebody's spiritual son or daughter. Listen, I'm done. I'm about to pray. This service is about to close. And, and, and you know, there are things that fathers get. We all understand 
that we live in a fatherless society in many ways. Now at the bridge, we got some dads that are crushing it. There are dads out there, you're crushing it, you're killing it. And we honor you. But in society, in general, we know we've got a, a father society. But in the house of God, we can begin to be father figures to young men and young women. And we can raise up spiritual sons and daughters. And we can see breakthrough. And there are things that you get from a father that you can't get anywhere else like security, protection, freedom from fear, anxiety, and danger. Belonging, that's a fitting in, a meshing within a close relationship. I fit here. Identity, which comes from the Latin meaning same as. Identity helps you realize I'm same as. You know why I don't want to look to, go to a church that looks like me? Just everybody looks like me? Because then people can't say I'm the same as. But you look around here, you can find somebody, and then you realize, you know what I'm really the same as? I'm the same as diversity. I'm the same as the kingdom. Come on. So even if your dad never gave you security belonging your identity, you can find them in the house. You can find them in the family. So I want to challenge you, Dad. Keep coming back. I also want to challenge you, men. Be spiritual fathers to some spiritual children. Be father figures. And then I want to pray that I want to say to everybody, God, right now, is busy turning the hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers. Will you let him turn your heart? If you say yes, I'm going to pray a prayer over everyone. I want you to stand to your feet right where you are in this room. At home, you can stand to your feet if you want to. You can put your hand ra uh, raise emoji up online right now. You can just, just take that little hand raise and say, include me in this prayer. Because whether you're on campus or online, whether you're live or later, this prayer can cover you. Wherever you are, just lift your hands to receive. Just say, say, God, I want to receive. I want to be a part of this prayer right now. God, you see hands all over this building. You see hands all over the world being lifted up right now. And so, God, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you're turning the hearts of fathers to children. You're turning the hearts of children to fathers. God, I thank you that you're healing and restoring relationships. And if we're here and we, had, we didn't have great role models as dads, let us find father figures in the house of God who will love us and give us security and identity and belonging. God, I pray that, that dads would have a, a, an urgency in them to restore relationship with their natural children, to build bridges with spiritual children. God, I ask for your kingdom to come, your will to be done in this house. God, you are such a good, good, loving Father, and I thank you that you help us to create that atmosphere of your goodness and your love and your grace in this house known as the bridge, in this family, this household of faith, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can you just give the Lord a hand clap? Come on, somebody thank God.